director for the center, I'm sorry, the Bud Shorstein Center for Jewish Studies um, here at the University of Florida. And I'm delighted to see um, that you came out for what promises to be a very interesting and, and I, I think important event um, this afternoon. Uh, the, the news from Israel has uh, thrown all of us um, and it, it may not seem like a terrific diversion um, to hear a, a panel uh, based on Nazi Germany right now. Um, but what this is really about um, is, is social protest and, and social engagement and, and the ability um, of ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Um, and I, I think that this is a lesson that uh, applies to us um, at, at any time. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Rosenstrasse protest uh, took place in February of 1943. It was the last roundup, or supposed to be the last roundup, of Jews in Berlin. Um, and the Jewish husbands of Aryan women uh, were arrested and held in a building in the Rosenstrasse before what was going to be their deportation to Auschwitz. Um, the wives actually got out and stood in front of the building, uh, you know, not just for an hour or so, but for days. Uh, and the German police really didn't know what to do. Goebbels thought that this was a very disagreeable situation. Um, Himmler and uh, Eichmann, of course, wanted to mow the women down, as I recall. Um, but ultimately, um, the regime blinked. Uh, and, and we have Nathan Stoltzfus here who wrote um, the prize-winning book on Rosenstrasse. And I remember the article on it, uh, article based on your book in The Atlantic um, that was titled, The Day Hitler Blinked. Uh, um, it, it's, it's really a lesson for all of us. Um, we have two panels today. Um, the first is a faculty panel, uh, which is um, not, not completely um, uh, uh, on the Holocaust, but on how the paradigm of the Rosenstrasse and, and individual and group action um, against uh, uh, terrible odds um, uh, can apply in other historical situations in our, in our own day. And then uh, we're going to take a very quick break of about five minutes, and we have four student presentations uh, based on their research. And, and of course, at, at UF and at FSU both, uh, we value undergraduate research tremendously as, as sort of a life-changing um, experience, and, and we're very proud to have them here. The, uh, what I'm also proud of is that, is that this is a joint uh, venture of sorts between uh, Florida State University and the University of Florida. Um, we're just down the road from each other, um, and it seems that the only thing we do together is play football and basketball against one another. And so um, I, I hope that this is the first time, uh, uh, the first of many times uh, that, that we can work together um, uh, um, because this is going to be uh, wonderful. I want to introduce uh, our faculty members first, and, and they will each uh, speak for about 10, 12 minutes, and then there will be some time uh, for Q&A, and then we'll break very quickly before the students take the floor. Um, and I will introduce them all um, in order, but I want to mention our, our, our many sponsors first. Uh, this is sponsored by uh, four entities. Um, one, the Bud Shorstein Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Florida. Um, also, the Rosenstrasse Foundation, um, which got its start at FSU, but, but now has uh, a branch here that we're trying to grow. And if you're interested in, in student research, um, do contact me, and I can get you set up with them. Also, we thank UF Hillel for sponsoring and, and for letting us use this beautiful space. Um, and Florida State University um, is sponsoring this event as well. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our, our faculty speakers in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Nathan Stoltzfus is the Dorothy and Jonathan Rintels <coughs> Professor of Holocaust Studies at Florida State University. And he is the author, uh, again, of the book on the Rosenstrasse, the prize-winning book, uh, Resistance of the Heart, Intermarriage and the Rosenstrasse Protest in Nazi Germany. Uh, he is most recently the author of Hitler's Compromises, Coercion and Consensus in Nazi Germany. 
Uh, Natalia Alexion, our own Natalia Alexion, is the Harry Rich Professor of Holocaust Studies here at the University of Florida. Um, she has two books, but her most recent is Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust, and she is working on two other books, um, one of which um, involves Jews in hiding uh, in Western Ukraine, and the other of which involves um, uh, Jews, uh, Poles, um, uh, medical study um, in um, interwar Poland. Uh, Steve Knoll um, is the instructional professor of history at the University of Florida. His research concerns the history of disability and environmental history. And his books include uh, The Feeble-Minded in Our Midst, um, which came out in 1995, and Mental Retardation in America, which came out in 04. He is working on a book on the 1977 protests for the rights of the disabled. So I will turn it over to our first faculty speaker, um, Dr. Nathan Stolstras. Well, thank you so much, Professor Lone Bird. I hope to retaliate with a good in introduction to you at some point in a suitable moment. Uh, thanks for hosting us. Thank you. I appreciate uh, uh, the uh, Bud Schoenstein uh, Center, Hillel, and uh, so happy to meet colleagues in the field here at the University of Florida. I agree with uh, Norm that uh, it's good that we can meet, not in competition, but actually collected to uh, promote and honor civil courage, everyday acts of, uh, in concrete acts on behalf of targeted minorities. My piece today is a talk on history, but I, as Norm said, we do see it as a paradigm for uh, actions these days, and, and I, I've never uh, hoped that my research would be so relevant as it is here today in Florida. Uh, so Jewish, non-Jewish uh, intermarriage, such an outstanding example of civil courage. I think it's outstanding because it's public. We have uh, open civil courage. We have a few other accounts of resistance and rescue, but uh, mostly clandestine and conspiratorial. And uh, uh, I, you know what, what is special about this civil courage, I think, is that uh, if you do it openly, you have some chance of affecting behavior generally. Social psychologists have this fine term called pluralistic ignorance, and it means, as far as I understand, that if you're in dissent, but don't know others are in dissent, you have a tendency to be quiet. But if somebody speaks up, and this is theory, doesn't always happen, uh, then there's a chance that a group will grow and that there will be a place for identity and for belonging and, and that, that, can, that can build, norms can be, can be set. These intermarried uh, non-Jewish women uh, took on the scorn of society at the same time they took on the, uh, the terror of the Gestapo facing it uh, every day. They, they had to choose and re-choose uh, on a continuing basis. Would they divorce or would they choose the fate of their partners and uh, quickly become uh, social outsiders, in fact, uh, socially dead friends previous friends would turn on a dime and become very scornful uh, enemies. And in fact, the uh, non-Jewish women who married Jewish men were said to live in a Jewish household and had that yellow star patch on their front door. So the Gestapo might have entered at any time and, and subject them to all the terrors uh, that meant. Now their climacteric act of defiance was the one that uh, that Norm described, the Rosenstrasse protest. Uh, was it possible that these women actually uh, rescued their uh, husbands from the jaws of Auschwitz? Uh, if you look from common perspectives, the answer is certainly not. Uh, common understandings of Hitler's rule is no more likely than an attack of killer tomatoes, as one uh, 
grad student remonstrated, no more possible than a fine Florida university without football, or maybe no more possible than uh, coming across a, an exquisite Florida wine. Uh, now, I suggest, though, that uh, what makes a difference here is finding the context. If you don't have a context, this seems like a fluke, something outside, something impossible. But there is context in Nazi history. There is context in the way that Hitler ruled uh, that, that can make this uh, story understandable, that makes it seem not just like a fluke, not just as an exception, not something that uh, can't be characterized because it's so totally out of character. A very fine professor one has fine, fond of and worked with when I was uh, packing off on the way to uh, a year of Fulbright in Germany uh, was rather perplexed when I said I'd heard about this protest and there were non-Jewish people protesting for Jews and then they were released and he said, my God, well, that won't take a year. Don't spend your whole Fulbright year. That's a six-month project. Now, I'm not sure at the most uh, what kind of uh, context he was thinking, but luckily at the same time, I had the guidance of uh, giants in the field, uh, Raoul Hilberg and Sybil Milton, who uh, immediately pointed out that uh, intermarriage is the context for understanding this. That's the immediate context. And secondly, how does the regime make decisions? How are you possibly going to understand what happened if you don't understand the ways that decisions are made, who makes them and under what conditions uh, the, the context of decision making about uh, so-called Jewish problem, the intermarried Jewish problem, specifically in Berlin at this time following the defeat, uh, massive debacle of the uh, German military at Stalingrad and, and just as equally important in Goebbels' diary, the, uh, the stepped up bombing day and night by the Allied, had him, uh, allies had him very worried about, uh, about uh, uh, morale, not to mention uh, his rivalries with uh, the so-called Three Kings who were against his efforts to implement the total war. So there really isn't uh, a single factor here, uh, but certainly rivals, uh, rivalries uh, ha had probably a role uh, to play among these uh, satraps. But I will say that uh, if all you know about Nazi Germany was that almost all of the German Jews <coughs> who survived survive because their partners refuse to divorce, you would walk away with some misconceptions. And that's, that's serious. No one claims that this story uh, tells the whole thing. Any story needs context. And uh, <clears throat> that's why, um, uh, you know, if, 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 but a particularly uh, necessary context in the case of outside stories. You need a very sturdy context for something that hasn't uh, really registered so that it can begin to be understood, can uh, begin to fit into uh, people's minds and, 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 and build up a constituency. Well, what do we learn from these non-Jewish women about civil courage? I would say first thing is that uh, start early and everybody says this now, it's not contested. If you see tyranny coming, you have to start resisting. Now, you have to be careful also not to scream fire in a theater crowded without a fire. Uh, so there's some uh, you know, delicacy there. Uh, certainly, uh, we learn from them that persistence is important, that it's not one and done. And finally, I think if you want to follow and learn from these women, you have to learn that you have to be willing to pay the ultimate price, and they were. That is, they put their lives on the line, and, and uh, you know, they signaled the whole time since Hitler uh, came to power that uh, when it came to their families, which one described as the essence and meaning of life for her family, 
that uh, they weren't going to be able to shake them apart. That was the regime's intention, to just intimidate them and threaten them, cajole them and woo them with the magnificent uh, historic Nazi uh, Reich. Uh, but that didn't work. And uh, <clears throat> it's often said rightly that we have to begin early to resist tyranny, but resistance is not like flipping a switch. What needs to be said is that we need to learn to prepare. How are we going to learn? What internships do we have in resistance? Before it gets out of control, before uh, the tyrants grab the media, the police, and popular support, what, uh, what we can learn from these women is how, uh, how we get started. It's one thing to say, okay, it's time to begin resisting. It's another to be prepared. But uh, how, how do they begin resisting early and persisting, building up capacity for defiance? They didn't start with the protests on the street, and I think that's important. They started the first day Hitler came to power with, uh, you know, as soon as their personal lives became political, they were forced into this defiance. <clears throat> so uh, these couples began, uh, and they practiced nonconformity at first, and then noncompliance with the state. Uh, lockstep society, they moved against the grain at the same time uh, as society as a whole was moving compromise by compromise ever further in the direction of following Hitler uh, and really not finding their way back, these were perforce learning defiance by defiance day by day. Uh, and, and that's why they stand out so brilliantly uh, against the, that, that backdrop now we can ask whether these, these persons are ordinary Germans. And it's an important question. I won't go into it here, but one thing we need to say is that they had motivations that the other Germans did not. Now, uh, you know, you, you can find ordinary things across uh, the board. I doubt they, they, they wouldn't have been so uh, politically active at all, I have reason to think, had they not been put into this context. So that's the point, though, that they built this up. That's part of it, I think, of, of civil courage, given the motivation. <clears throat> resistance, uh, their resistance of defiance was not something that they added on, not something they did on the side. It was themselves. Defiance was who they were when they personal lives became political, they began building up courage. They faced those barking armed guards on the streets saying, clear the streets or we'll shoot. And their stand was what Professor Judy Baumel Schwartz has called day-to-day -day stand, Amida, resistance. And this was a characteristic particularly of women, uh, she wrote. And I think it's also um, uh, characteristic of that great dissident and playwright and uh, president, Vaclav Havel, who talked about the attempt to live in the truth. And I think what adds magnificence to that model is that word attempt, because we're always just attempting. There's always an ideal, and uh, it's never just arriving at living in the truth and just coasting and being there. Every moment, it's existential. It's, it's a demand in every situation. It's new. How do you do it? Um, what does it mean? And no doubt it meant compromises based on, on what I uh, heard from these women as well. Uh, really soul-piercing compromises uh, not putting anybody else's life in danger, but ending up, you know, voting for Hitler, for example, just because the SS showed up and said, let me accompany you to the polls, uh, the plebiscite in 1936. Uh, so, um, 
<clears throat> I wanted to say as well that uh, you know these 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 women, uh, some of them uh, were expelled by their family of birth. Elsa Holzer talked about that how how uh, heartrending that was how how she didn't even tell her husband not wanting to add that to his burden uh, with all that he had uh, to deal with. Now in conclusion, I want to ask what might we learn from this case of intermarriage about the regime? What do we perceive more clearly? That's the point. It's not that you know there's a whole radical shifting. I mean, it might be a little bit like a kaleidoscope. You turn and see something slightly different, you see the same things. But it's what do we, uh, what, what comes out of the shadows uh, that might have been hidden there uh, because the canon has been built up and built up and built up and, and then we might have even less a chance of seeing what's off to the side. And I do say that, uh, you know, the intermarried couples were actually pariahs then and they've been outsiders in histories uh, since then. So. Uh, the first thing we see more clearly, I think, is uh, the importance of the myth of Hitler. Really, uh, it becomes uh, the crucial. Uh, secondly, we see that there were uh, limits to the ways that uh, people could effectively work towards the Fuhrer. That is, people asking themselves in everyday life, especially policymakers, what would Hitler do? How could I fulfill Hitler's wishes? Uh, that within the Reich, uh, and, and a close relative of that is cumulative radicalization. These are jargon terms, but uh, supposedly, uh, <clears throat> you know, Hitler's satraps radicalized violence and moved toward the, and arrived at the final solution as it was called. Uh, but that didn't work within the Reich where Hitler actually restrained, restrained the Gauleiter regional directors from using even soft forms of coercion when it came to trying to move whole sections of people and evacuate them in the way of bombings, for example. We see cases of this uh, examples in the intermarriage as well. The regime just made one concession, then it made another concession, always temporary. Of course, the uh, ideology didn't change. Of course, the Gestapo was still set on on total destruction, but Hitler was capable of moving laterally, recalculating in order to move forward toward the same goals. So uh, these are only uh, episodes, really. And, and to be sure, uh, this was never intended that intermarried Jews would survive. And uh, things just uh, moved uh, in a way due to the war that, uh, uh, that uh, made that impossible. So in conclusion, I think uh, this is indeed a case of the fortune of survival, as some said. But what I want to underline is that it's uh, critical for the understanding of this fortune to know that civil courage was behind it. Without it, these intermarried Jews too would have perished. What we see is that these intermarried couples sculpted their fortune. They were able to do this only because one partner was not Jewish, and they were also able to do it only because they willingness to pay the ultimate price, their life itself. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. And it's, um, it's wonderful to follow up, although difficult to follow up after this uh, presentation, but I think that they are in uh, interesting conversation and I was uh, taking energetically taking notes because so much of um, what you uh, have mentioned is interestingly relevant, but maybe in somewhat different way for the couples that I'm looking at. And now I think with my two PhDs, I still need help uh, with how to activate the PowerPoint uh, hiding here somewhere. Oh, here, not really hiding. So 
So um, I want to share with you uh, my ongoing research, something that came out of uh, research on hiding uh, in uh, Western, uh, Western uh, Ukraine. And I, I'm thinking about nonconformity and noncompliance that is so central to the story of Rosenstrasse um, protest and to the stories of uh, mixed uh, marriages, although I'm interested in uh, not only intermarried couples among uh, Polish Jews, but also relationships that did not become formal marriages uh, during, uh, before the war, sometimes during the war, and sometimes they were never formalized after the war either. One thing that I need to say that uh, in contrast to many of these uh, um, intermarried couples that left behind in, uh, in Germany, left behind paper trail, uh, I'm working with very fragmentary stories. And I'm interested in um, intimacy of their um, protest. It's very much not a public protest. Uh, in, and stories that sometimes really only allude to the fact that there was an intermarried uh, uh, couple and that uh, this um, marriage allowed for either the rescue of the spouse, of the Jewish spouse, or in the case of this short letter written by one Władysława Blicerowa, who just says, I was married to a Jew, uh, he was betrayed, he was murdered, uh, I'm left with a Jewish child. And she's asking, this is right after the war, she's asking from a uh, Jewish uh, organization of survivors to help her raising this Jewish child. Now, I was uh, unable to find any additional details about her husband, about her own life, about the child and what happened with them. And in fact, I'm somewhat surprised because uh, um, where she would have gotten married to a Jew, this should not have legally happened. And yet she has Jewish last name with a Slavic ending that indicates this is the name of her husband. But I'm only using this story to, to tell you how this is always just fragments of extremely complex relationships, or extremely complex rescue uh, and, and uh, non-conformity stories. Uh, my research focuses on, on this region, uh, but uh, in a way uh, is typical more for Eastern European Jewry where uh, mixed marriage before the war was an exception. It's nowhere close to the numbers we know from Germany uh, or from Bohemia for that matter. Uh, it's rather exceptional and in that respect this nonconformity is certainly part of the makeup of these couples before the war. Of course, this is not a matter of danger. This is a matter of standing against family and, and social milieu, in fact, on both sides uh, very often. So in a way, these are uh, relationships that are somehow marked already for having um, the strength uh, to oppose whatever is the expectation and whatever might be the pressure uh, from, uh, from the outside. And this cuts across different social classes. It's between the educated, between the working class, um, um, traditional, not traditional. Uh, there are some situations in which these relationships uh, and marriages happen more often than in others, such as on the left wing of the political spectrum. Some of these couples m meet in the communist youth movements or at universities, but there is really no one pattern. And I'm interested in all these questions for which I don't have time, uh, but uh, we'll move to some stories just to give you a taste of how these nonconformity um, uh, relationships, marriages and relationships, uh, uh, striving for nonconformity and then rescue how this works. So this is again another just a fragmentary uh, story of a woman uh, named um, uh, Trincherova. Uh, you have uh, here just her 
uh, post-war registration, uh, Berta Trincher, she survived together with her husband and her toddler daughter. But as she escapes from the burning ghetto uh, of Stanislavov, uh, Ivano-Frankivsk today, uh, and she, this is a very moving testimony as she's uh, leaving behind the burning ghetto, holding by her daughter by her hand. She has false identity papers and a few dollars, and she's hoping to make it to Lviv, Lviv Lemberg, uh, where she has a, an uncle. An uncle who married a Catholic woman, converted, married, cut off all relationships from his family, and now she is hoping to find him in Lvov and make this uncle sort of an anchor of her own survival. Uh, the uncle apparently was betrayed uh, as a baptized Jew by neighbors just a few days before Berta arrives in Lvov, arrested and murdered. Uh, but for me here, it's important to think about these um, relationships and families and uh, intermarried couples uh, as they become anchors of hope and rescue for other members of the Jewish families of the Jewish spouse. And in fact, many of those non-Jewish wives and husbands tend to try to help shelter, uh, organize uh, false identity papers to um, their, um, their husbands, their wives, uh, nephews, um, uh, cousins, uncles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think of them as emotional communities. Uh, those families that sometimes did not have many interactions before the war because, as in the case of uh, Trincher, the family cut off relations, but then they become, in a way, united in their efforts uh, to rescue. Um, however, Jews in this region, uh, they become part of the story. They come under the Nazi occupation in the summer of 1941. So they come into this situation with knowledge of how mixed marriages, how intermarried couples and families were treated in the Third Reich. And uh, I find it also very interesting how people are trying to make sense. You mentioned this trying to make sense by, day by day, what the policies are. So here's one of those testimonies of uh, the liberal rabbi in the Jewish community in Lvov, David Kahane, who describes uh, um, heartbreaking scenes of divorces uh, of women who had married Jewish men converted to Judaism, and now they were divorcing them in rabbinical court early on under the German occupation when both decided that maybe this would save the children. So here, not staying together is a strategy that they hope to take uh, as a rescue uh, strategy for uh, members of their families. This will eventually turn out to be false uh, hope. And in fact, the practice, even though Nuremberg laws were theoretically applied to District Galicia, the reality was that uh, the definition of a Jew and half Jew was very broad. And being half Jewish or being married to a spouse who refused to divorce you would not protect you, you would not save you. Uh, not you and not uh, your children. And I went in the wrong direction, I think. So I want to uh, give you just two more examples. One is a testimony of this boy, Hieronim Meislisch, uh, another young boy from Lvov, born in 1935. He survived in hiding, hidden, this is him uh, many years later in Israel. Uh, he survived hidden by one guy, he describes him as one Emil, a teacher, a, a wonderful man who was a friend of a family. But when I started digging uh, for what is exactly the story of the rescue, it turned out that Emil, who at some point had some uh, 15 members of um, Hieronym's family hidden in his apartment, was in fact the boyfriend of his aunt. And the boyfriend, uh, the relationship started under the Soviet occupation. This is something very interesting and very unique to the region. Uh, this uh, area comes under the Soviet occupation in the fall of 1939, so 
two years, almost two years until uh, the, the Nazis come. And in the conditions of the Soviet occupation, the communal restraint, the communal pressure are not dating uh, across religious lines went down. And it, I think that a lot of relationships that became crucial for rescue start during this period. One of them, um, Emil and his girlfriend, they in fact uh, started living together. She didn't go to the ghetto, she lived with him. And then half of her family sheltered under his roof. The story doesn't end um, as a complete happy end because they were uh, betrayed and uh, from the family only Emil and his uh, aunt uh, survived. The aunt uh, converted to Catholicism after the war and uh, stay, stayed under her um, assumed identity uh, after. Um, but uh, but uh, that relationship saved, uh, saved the boy's life. Here is again example of a Soviet occupation, another couple, this is a, a relationship between a Jewish woman, uh, Mila, Mira um, Axelrad, and a Ukrainian man uh, who, uh, whom uh, she married under the Soviet occupation, and then he was trying to rescue uh, both her and her younger sister. And when he was no longer able himself to protect her, uh, her and her sister, he turns to his own parents and using religious symbols, asks the parents to swear on the holy icon that they would protect his wife. Uh, very clear from the testimony that the family, the Ukrainian family was not thrilled about this marriage, but they, found, they felt bound and they took in fact huge rescue, personal rescue, not only vis-a-vis -vis the Germans, but vis-a-vis -vis their own uh, ethnic uh, community, as uh, their neighbors likely were suspicious because of the marriage, marriage being public. And here is this uh, um, difference between uh, publicly known relationships and th those that were not yet publicly known. And just one last story. Uh, about this boy, uh, Isidor Hecht. He is here, um, obviously a very young uh, child, but he starts as well in the Soviet um, times um, as the testimonies of his sister states, uh, starts dating a, a woman, uh, and then she prepares a hiding place for him, for his sister, for his parents, and two more Jews. Uh, so she becomes this tremendously active uh, 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 rescuer, and it's clearly motivated. You are talking about this personal motivation for taking the risk and for being non-compliant uh, for a, a whole group of people that she ends up um, rescuing. And there is a tremendous burden to that rescue uh, um, this is a quote from a handwritten diary that Isidor Hecht writes in hiding. I hope one day to be able to publish it. Uh, unfortunately, his son does not want uh, his father's story to be known. Um, I hope one day this will be possible. Uh, but uh, the, the diary very much describes this man sitting in a in a stable and worrying about his Polish Christian girlfriend, about the risk she had taken, about the physical toll uh, and emotional toll uh, that the rescue um, mission has on her. And in fact, there is one moment in the diary when he describes that uh, when they were almost discovered, uh, which would mean for her also death, she actually went gray overnight. So whether this is a metaphor or a real situation, I think it describes not just this daily toll, but also tremendous, uh, tremendous um, determination, something that you talked <coughs> about in your presentation. Thank you very much.
I'm Steve Knoll. Thank you for having me. Um, when Norm asked me to do this, I had no idea why the hell he wanted me to be here. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm an Americanist. I don't work at all on any of the, these things. But um, looking at the things that I look at regarding um, disability, um, I find that protest matters that people take it upon themselves to make a difference and to put themselves out there um, regarding making change. And so the title of this is Nothing About Us Without Us, which I think is, is a great um, statement of the disability rights movement. And um, that will be the title of, of my book on the 1977, um, the 1977 disability rights protest. So I'm going to start with something very simple. I'm going to start with something that we take for granted. Um, daily life, um, stepping down from a curb, moving around, being able to navigate the world. And certainly the way the world was into the 1970s was very debilitating for people in wheelchairs, for people with crutches. They couldn't get around. And today we have, this is taken yesterday on the University of Florida campus, we have curb cuts. And we take those as a natural, normal part of the physical environment. That shit's there forever. It's been there. And that stuff is there because it's there, right? And we don't understand that it is there because of the actions and protests and attitudes and fighting of people with disabilities to change what we think is typical, normal, average. And I think that's really important because for them, this changed the world. And something as, as small as that really makes a big difference in their ability to be quote unquote normal, whatever that means, right? And proving that the disability is actually within society itself and not necessarily within the body of the person. And when we talk about them, we, we look at these icons of the disability rights movement. And I think it's really interesting and important how marginalized we look at these individuals. You know, we know about Dr. King, right? We know about the civil rights movement. We know about the, the people um, within, the, within the gay rights movement. But people like Judy Heumann and Ed Roberts are people who are just as important within the movement for disability rights as those people that we know. But they're marginalized. And these individuals took it upon themselves to um, make a difference by their, by their public protest, by their putting it on the line for their entire lives. You know, um, Ed Roberts goes to the University of California in 1962, the same year that James Meredith um, integrates University of Mississippi. And University of Mississippi, oh my God, everybody knows this, you know, within the canon of American civil rights. But no one knows about Ed Roberts, right? And Judy Heumann um, becomes the first disabled person to be a public school teacher in New York City, you know? And she does that by protesting because they don't want her to be there. You can't be a teacher, you can't reach the blackboard. She said, well, change the damn height of the blackboard so I can reach it, and actually takes it to court and wins. So, um, you know, here they are, and um, Ed, Ed Roberts protesting civil rights for the disabled, using the, the metaphors and ideas of the civil rights movement, and this great thing, right? Too many programs for the handicapped, and again, using terminology that today is rather outdated, but Judy would not complain much because she's writing this. I've been cut because we haven't been aggressive or vocal. You know? It's up to us. You know, people aren't going to give us things. And I think that's, you know, oh, we feel sorry for these people. Let's give them rights. No, no, we demand those rights. And, and you're not going to give them to us. They're ours because we are citizens, not because you feel sorry for us. So um, we're going to look at um, 19, 1977. And uh, I think uh, if you're in my classes, you know the hashtag. Hashtag words matter, right? And the word is patient, right? So patient no more. We're not going to be patient and wait till you decide it's nice to fix the world. We're going to demand it when? Now. And also, we're not a patient. We are not a medical model, right? We are a person. So don't call us a patient. Don't say we're medical issues. Oh, you know, oh, in that wheelchair, let's fix it. No. So patient no more has many meanings. And in 19, in 1977, this was the thing that was up in the back when Nathan was talking. Um, 
504, 1973, four years before that, um, a vocational rehabilitation bill was passed uh, uh, by the United States Congress, signed by Richard Nixon, um, in which we're giving money to help those people who need vocational rehabilitation, mostly veterans, right? But somewhere in the back of this bill of 57 pages, there's a section called 504. And in this section, it's kind of a throwaway. No one even knows who put it in there. It says that no federal funding can be provided for any organization or agency that discriminates on the basis of disability. And people with disabilities see this and say, OMG, right? They say, oh my God, this means that we have civil rights. But in order for this to be enacted, it has to be signed, it has to be uh, enacted in law again, right? And so Nixon, passes, uh, signs the bill, but doesn't sign the, the enabling legislation for 504. So he's busy with Watergate and all this other stuff. He doesn't sign it. Uh, Gerald Ford becomes president. He's busy with pardoning Nixon. He doesn't sign it, right? So Jimmy Carter becomes president in 1976, and the assumption is good liberal lefty Jimmy Carter, he'll sign it, right? And Jimmy doesn't sign it. And so these people are pissed off. These people saying, you know what? It's time, and they take to the streets. They take to the streets, Judy Human in New York, Ed Roberts in San Francisco, and people all over. And the longest occupation of federal buildings in American history is by groups of people with disabilities that take over federal buildings demanding that government sign this. Right? Um, uh, access, and the sign or resign. Uh, that's the, that is the, the phrase for Joseph Califano, who's the secretary of HEW at this point. Um, you know, sign it or resign, you know? Access is a civil right, access to buildings, right? Um, and they protest. Federal government shuts off the water in these buildings. So, you know, can't go to the bathroom. Have to leave. I say, you know what, buddy? We couldn't go to the bathroom anyway because we can't get into the stalls because we're in wheelchairs. That doesn't bother us at all, you know? Then they cut off the telephone. Guess what? That's before they had cell phones. Anybody remember? What the they didn't have cell phones. You guys don't know that. But second floor, people are signing. So that doesn't stop them anymore. Oh my God, how can we get these people the hell out of here? I don't get how, you know how we can do it? We can sign the damn legislation. Right? And so finally, Jimmy Carter signs the enabling legislation. A huge victory. Victory. Handi handicap use pressure to push h and to implement the 1973 bias law, right? This is from the New York Times. You know, that's a small issue. And, and remarkable stuff. A victory in which people with disabilities weren't given this. They went to the streets and protested and demanded it and got it, right? So, you know, today in disability history, 1977, there's Judy Human looking very young there, right? Signed 504 now, right? Guess what? It's signed. And the other thing is how interesting this cross, cuts across assumed barricades and this word which I don't particularly like to use but this word intersectionality uh, there's African Americans with disabilities too and, you know, under a double burden in American society black and disabled and you know, Johnny Lacey black disabled and female in American society and they get of all groups the Black Panthers involved in supporting these and the Black Panthers in San Francisco provide food for these people while they're in the building so you know remarkable kind of connectivity between this and you know there's Jimmy Carter signing it and there's people in his office and so this is the precursor to the official assumption of disability rights, which is 1990, ADA, right? American with Disabilities Act, right? And the assumption, once again, is this is signed under Republican administration, George Bush, and oh, all the legislators felt a need, a crying need to help these people with disabilities. We see them uh, having problems on the bus. We see them not being able to take the New York City subway, and we're going to help them. Well. It takes the Capitol crawl, which is another iconic moment in disability rights history, right? In which people attempt to go to the United States Capitol, and they can't because we've all seen those damn steps, right? So what do they do? I mean, it's a, it's a public event, and they do this purposely. They get out of their wheelchairs, and they climb up the steps of the Capitol. I mean, you can't ask for a more poignant, symbolic moment than we can't get to where we need to be. Right? And certainly, it's great. You know, disabled persons rally, crawl up. Congress scores protests, delays 
scores protest delays, right? A logjam in the House is expected to break soon. Why? Because they protested, because these people, and you know, it's everybody. It's not just people like Judy Human and, um, and um, Ed Roberts. It's people bring their children who are in wheelchairs and climbing up there. So it's a remarkable achievement, right? And you know, three months later, George Bush signs it and says, oh, I signed it because I can. Well, no, you signed it because people with disabilities put your ass to the fire, put Congress's ass to the fire. And certainly here they are using the symbolic notions of the civil rights movement, right? You know, and here he is, this is Justin Dart, who is another, another um, activist who gets to be on the, who gets to be on the dais with, with Bush, and he's the president of this organization called ACCD, um, Association of Citizens um, with, um, collective disabilities, right? And this is Ed Roberts' wheelchair. Right? Ed Roberts dies in um, 1995, um, proving that certainly people with disabilities still have issues with medical stuff. Lifespan of them is significantly shorter. He dies in March of um, 1990, 1995. And two months later, there's a knock on the door of the Smithsonian Museum of American History. And guess what? Somebody brings his wheelchair there with a sign. This needs to be in the in the museum. The guy's what the hell out of here. What are you doing? No. <laughs> and somebody um, talks to somebody who was a curator or talks to somebody else, and they say, Oh my God, it's Ed Roberts' wheelchair. We need that. This is symbolic of what happens with disability and protest and the importance of it. So it's there now. It's there now. Um, you can go to the you can go to the museum and for a while it was in a closet which is just really interesting until uh, other curators said this needs to be out in the public place. So ADA, ADA, um, 33 years, a testament to the ability of people with disabilities to um, protest and make their needs known and not be dependent on others, hence the term nothing about us without us. You know, and I'll end with, with this. Uh, yeah. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Martin Luther King in this. Um, people with disabilities protesting. This is in, in the 1977. And then um, Gabby, my student here who's actually working on Fannie Lou Hamer this semester. I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer, we know her as the black activist who organized the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party, Freedom Democratic Party in 1964, um, involved in, in civil rights legislation, in voting rights. But she's also a person with disabilities. She's also a person, a victim of Mississippi appen appendectomy. You know what a Mississippi appendectomy is? Mississippi appendectomy is, we're gonna take your appendix out, lady, and in the process, we're gonna tie your tubes, you know, because you're not worth having children. So she's a victim of that. So, and she also is, has polio, right? And so, you know, she is not just black activist. She is a woman who is also engaged heavily in the disability rights and movement. So nobody's free until everybody's free. So I think that's the message we get from here. Thank you. And I can actually maybe get rid of this thing. Maybe. Nah, I can't. <laughs> We'll leave it up there. Um, we have about five minutes uh, for questions for our panelists. I'd like to thank uh, Nathan, Natalia, and Stu for wonderful presentations, but um, we're trying to stay on schedule a little bit. So are there any questions? Yes, Rachel. Um, thank you. These were all such interesting presentations. Um, for uh, Steve Null, I was wondering, I know this is a little off topic, but since so many of us um, know of President Franklin Roosevelt, right. um, I'm curious if you think his, um, he in any way, despite all he did to try to hide his disability, if he helped uh, increase. Yeah, that's history. interesting because I actually, in my, in my diversity class this morning, we were talking about FDR, his, his hidden disability. Um, you know, even though he does a great job of hiding it, and the press is remarkable in its ability to to go along with this, you know, there's only there's only two pictures extant of FDR in a wheelchair, right? Um, everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows, right? In spite of the fact that he tries to hide it, and the fact that you know he he says he can walk, and everybody you know he can't walk, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it certainly the ability to give people hope during the depression. It's this guy, and again, it's that overcoming. You know, want to overcome it, 
overcoming my disability. If he can overcome that, we can overcome the depression. So I think really for sure that um, it, it's, it's an important part of his persona. And I think it's, it's a really powerful part of the New Deal. Mm, thank you. And my other question is just about this history of the Rosenstrasse. I've never heard of this until I was in grad school. And I'm sure it is challenging for the Jewish religious communities to tell the story because of our feelings about intermarriage. Um, and in fact, if this were an Orthodox or more conservative Jewish organization, they might not have been interested in posting this. I don't know. But um, I wonder if, if any of our guests know about how Jewish organizations in America or Jewish historians have dealt with this and whether it has been more widely shared than I know. That's a great question. I can't. Uh, no, that's an excellent <laughs> question. I just know that my agent said that Hadass is not going to review that book because it's about marriage and that was just a, uh, you know, uh, symptom or a representation and uh, yeah I feel sheepish about it however it's uh, you know the story is also about non-Jews it's inevitably about the Holocaust uh, <clears throat> but it, it you know one of my Israeli friends once remarked that you know an Israeli or an observant Jew is not going to write that thing <laughs> and uh, somebody's not Jewish isn't because they wouldn't be interested in it uh, but uh, you know, I grew up in an ex 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 extreme nonconformist environment, and this whole thing, uh, I had a professor uh, in grad school who was interested in uh, all the forms of power you could exercise without uh, shooting a gun, uh, or as he said, poking holes in somebody. So uh, I was interested in protest, and this, uh, it interested me, and I wanted to learn how, you know. And it turned out quite, uh, uh, you know, that the, the Nazi dictatorship, especially in war, with Hitler concerned about his image, was more sensitive to uh, signs of dissent than just about any other autocracy. And that goes against a lot of common <laughs> thinking. Uh, but, it, you know, uh, because he wanted to maintain his image among his people, he recognized as the only engine of his uh, great aspirations to achieve them. So uh, all of this... Uh, became, I thought I would segue quickly into uh, East German communism and uh, protest there, but I never made it. One more, Alice, um, or Steve. I thought that the, I was at Berkeley when Robert said it was a very emotional for me to see him because I used to pass him every day on uh -huh. Avenue. Yeah. And he always had people around him. Sure. I think those were the, one of the first streets that got the yeah, curve. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, th that's one of those things that, you know, there are many places that say we have the first curve cuts, but, 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 but Berkeley for sure, yes. But, so the point is that I think it connected to the, the anti-war movement. Yes. Because, for, yes. as you didn't mention that, because there were disabled anti-war parents, sure, and yes. that gave fuel to the project. Yeah. Also, yeah. it seemed <clears throat> to be a harder step than other protests because actual money was involved with each institution and each city and each building, right? Oh yeah, yes. I mean, certainly the fact that he's even able to live there in the dorms, you know, they've got to retrofit the dorms. And for two years, he lived in the, he lived in the infirmary on the ground floor because they were afraid, because at night he had to live in an iron wall, right? Sometimes so, on the street. Right, so, so they were afraid that you know, if he was living on the second floor of, of Broward, that, that the weight of the iron lung would collapse. And he, so, so, yeah. So, yeah. And again, that gets to the, the thing about intersectionality. You know, anti war protest. You can see in that, that great picture. Let's see if I can. See, this is why I kept it up. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I kept it up. Let's see if we can. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, this is Sacramento. This is the um, this is the California state capital. But you know, you got you got the long hairs, you know, involved here. So yes, yeah, so yes, good. Thank you. We have to stay on schedule, folks, and I, I want to get to our um, student presentation. So we're going to take a very quick five minute.
break. I think all five minute breaks are pretty quick, but this will be a quick five minute break. Have a cookie, uh, have something to drink, and uh, and we'll reconvene. Uh, student research is, uh, is, is very special um, to both of our institutions, obviously. And um, if you're from UF, uh, then you know uh, that we have various opportunities here for student research. And as, as um, our panelists will tell you, um, it, it is truly um, a life-changing experience, I, I think, to, to pick a topic and just wrestle with it uh, for a year and then, and then to gain insights into it and then to present on it. Um, it it's really one of the terrific experiences at our two institutions. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, j before I introduce our um, student panelists, I'm going to hand around these rock cards um, from the Bud Shorstein Center. Please take one. It'll tell you our social media, how to uh, sign up for uh, our, our newsletter, um, and our, uh, you'll get info on our future programs and, and all of that. Um, so here we go. I don't think we're quite going from, uh, from left to right, but I'm going to introduce in order um, that they will be speaking. Um, Danielle Wersansky is a PhD candidate at Florida State University uh, studying modern European history uh, and, and actively exploring the intricate dynamics of gender and sexuality, public history, and war and society. Uh, she has a minor, which you can do at Florida State um, uh, in Holocaust pedagogy, of course, they had this wonderful institute um, every summer on Holocaust pedagogy. Um, and uh, she, she really uh, embodies a commitment to intertwining um, historical awareness to creative endeavors. Our, our lone gator um, is, is Emma uh, Reiser, Reiser um, who was at Florida State and transferred um, here. Uh, she is a senior here at the University of Florida. She is majoring um, political science uh, in political science, and she hopes, uh, expects to go to law school um, next year. Uh, she's been working with the Rosenstrasse Foundation uh, for three years now, since 2020, and has been a research assistant uh, and, and has done um, biographical research um, on those involved in the Rosenstrasse protest as well. Uh, her work through the foundation has been focused on researching um, life testimonies of Holocaust survivors. Uh, Sarah Brophy um, is a junior at Florida State University studying political science and history. Uh, she's been with the Rosenstrasse um, Foundation since just about last year uh, and does uh, biographical research um, as well. She is currently the president of the Rosenstrasse Foundation at Florida State, and she works on research on the gendered aspects of privileged marriages, not the ones you just heard about, but privileged um, marriages um, uh, under the Nazi regime. And finally, uh, Riley Maresca um, is at Florida State University studying history and English. Um, he currently serves as the vice president of the Rosenstrasse Foundation at FSU. He is also pursuing a certificate within the Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security with an interest in disaster history and scholarship. Um, I will turn things over then to our student panel. And Danielle Wersansky, you are up. Hi everybody, my name is Danielle Wersansky. It was 2013, so almost exactly 10 years ago um, to, to today, that I first learned about the Rosenstrasse protest. I was an undergraduate student studying at Florida State University, and I was actually at that time majoring in theater and creative writing. I had just been accepted to the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program at FSU, or Europe, and I was looking through this database of research projects that undergrad research assistants could apply to work on with graduate students and professors. And that was when I discovered Dr. Stolzfus's project on the Rosenstrasse protest. And 
I was really fascinated by its story and I was shocked that I had never heard of it. As an Israeli Jewish woman who felt that I was very well versed in Holocaust history, I couldn't believe that I knew nothing about the Rosenstrasse protest and I found that unacceptable. So even though I'd never worked on a history research project, I made an impassioned plea. I remember writing it to Dr. Solzfa saying like, I know I have no background or experience, but I'm really, really passionate about this. And please, please, I hope that you'll let me work on this project. And he very graciously accepted. And that was when I began my deep dive into the history of the Rosenstrasse protest. So that year, I started by tracking trends of academic scholarship and opinions um, in literature written about the Rosenstrasse protest, but also looking at uh, the controversial speeches that were made by the Bishop von Galen about Nazi Germany's misdeeds um, over the decades and tra tracking to see if there were any trends in how people were looking at these events. And by the end of that academic year, I was hooked on research. So not only my own research interests, which Dr. Solstice encouraged me to pursue, um, but in continuing to do research for Dr. Solstice on the Rosenstrasse protests, and I ended up remaining Dr. Solstice's research assistant even after I graduated from Europe until I graduated as um, an undergrad. And the project evolved over time. So we began looking at Wikipedia pages for the Rosenstrasse protest and then at other Holocaust related pages on the site. And at first we were comparing it by language. Um, I'm proficient in Hebrew, so I was comparing Wikipedia pages about certain Holocaust events in English to their Hebrew counterparts. Um, I was part of a group of other assistants that each compared it, the Wikipedia pages in different languages, including German and Serbian to name a few. And it was really fascinating to see the differences between the pages based on language and also the national entity that watched over the page because I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but if a page is written in like German, then it's usually watched over by the German government and the same for each. So the Polish pages are watched over by Polish national entities. Um, so different countries had different or unique messages that they wanted to share with readers and each focused on different aspects of the event. So some countries wanted to highlight um, specific aspects of an event while others wanted those aspects brushed under the rug when talking about the Holocaust and historical memory of it. I was specifically partnered with another assistant who spoke German and so we mostly compared and contrasted trends between English, German, and Hebrew pages about the Holocaust on Wikipedia. And we unearthed really interesting information about how each nation crafts its narrative of the Holocaust. Bias ran rampant in what was supposed to be a neutral and impartial platform. So I'm sure many of you are aware with the controversy regarding Poland and Holocaust history. Uh, Poland has long shied away from its involvement in perpetration during the Holocaust and in fact in 2018 the act of December 18th uh, in 19 wait, wait, what are I, oh yeah so they amended a new law in 2018 I was confusing myself and essentially what the law says is if anybody uh, states or writes that the Polish people were in were involved or participated or were per perpetrators of the Holocaust then you can be arrested or fined if you're in Poland to narrate or nutshell the law for you. So it was really fascinating to see how Poland, after, especially with this law coming into place, affected the Polish related Holocaust pages. So I have very personal experience with how the Polish government um, reacts to, to, to that kind of narrative and how active they are at monitoring it. So in that year, I wrote a film review of a documentary on the Treblinka death camp. And without really thinking too much about it, I called it a Polish death camp in the article, rather than a death camp in Poland. And I put it, I posted the article link on Twitter and I logged out because that was all that I used it for. I just posted my articles and I logged off. And when I went in the next week to post my next article, I saw that I had been swarmed by thousands and thousands of users when I think I had like five followers on the platform before that. And I was being trolled by thousands of Polish, I don't know if they're all bots, but Polish bots and Polish people who were protesting my phrasing in it. But I hadn't noticed it. I didn't get email notifications. I didn't know that it was a problem. And because I had not gone into my article and rectified my wording, 
They went above my head because I wasn't responding. And they ended up uh, escalating the situation until somehow they found the, the email addresses of all the professors on my undergraduate majors in the honor thesis project and emailed them telling them what a terrible person I was and demanding that they force me to make the change in my article. Um, so <laughs> they were able to track down a lot of private information for me and in the end I did make the change. So by the end of my undergraduate career, researching resistance during the Holocaust, and specifically the Rosenstrasse protest, was so much a part of my life and daily activities that it only made sense to pivot my studies from theater and creative writing and begin studying history with Dr. Sultzfus. As my official advisor, I began studying and pursuing my master's in history. And during that time, I was able to grade alongside Dr. Stolzfus as he taught Weimar and Nazi Germany courses, which indubitably helped to deepen my understanding of the buildup to the Rosenstrasse protests and the Holocaust. And as a graduate assistant, I was promoted from research assistant to research supervisor, and under Dr. Stolzfus's tutelage, began to mentor the new cohorts of Europe students who would join the project each year. And now instead of just looking at the information in the Wikipedia pages, we began to explore the, the, the factors of the bias we would encounter on these Holocaust related pages. So we began to fact check what was on the page. We meticulously began to cross check sources used to make sure that they were scholarly and impartial and even check citations to be sure that page numbers were correct and that the material reference was being interpreted correctly because we found references to picture books or where uh, books where editors were the author of self-published books and were inserting them into Wikipedia pages to promote their own books and things like that. So we also began to, dug deep, to dig deeper into the narratives that were being constructed and we started to question why it was written in this way and by whom. So how many different editors worked on a single page over what span of time, what kind of changes had been made over time we really thoroughly investigated the Wikipedia editors. Who were they? And what was their background that qualified them to write on the Holocaust? And most importantly, what were their motives? So we found a dizzying array of different characters from scholars to schoolboys who wrote that they, they had envisioned a, a, a leftist block emerging in their school courtyard. I always remember that one quote that that editor had on his Wikipedia bio. Um, some editors shared a lot of information about themselves, while others were very private. Some shared enough information that we were able to find them in the real world, beyond Wikipedia, where we could further examine their motivations. We found self-published authors peddling their own texts by inserting them into the footnotes. We found high schoolers whose self-proclaimed expertise came from watching war movies. The assistants and I also began to discover an even darker underbelly to Wikipedia and its many issues with bias, um, which Wikipedia is actually aware of. They have a page of statistics on, on, of their own editors that highlight the discrepancies, such as an imbalance in men and women editors, um, the imbalance between editors who are young and old, and more. So editors face bias themselves, women editors in particular. We found that men editors heavily outweighed women editors and that women editors faced more roadblocks. Because when you start as an editor on Wikipedia, every change that you make has to be approved by a more senior editor. So the only way to work your way up the chain of command is by making more edits and having them approved. So it can take time to get to a level where you no longer need to have every edit that you make um, approved before they go through. So it, editors that public, publicly identified as women or uh, had girlish aspects to their usernames were less likely to have their edits approved, um, which doesn't really allow women to climb the ranks of editorship very easily. So we had our research assistants create two editor accounts, one with a more girlish username and one with a more masculine or gender neutral username and they also experienced these same biases that we were seeing as greater trends. So edits that they proposed under the girlish ID were denied, while the same edits would be pushed through when proposed by their masculine accounts. This also brought us into the world of sock puppets, which is one of my favorite phrases. But on Wikipedia, sock puppetry, or socking, uh, refers to the misuse of multiple Wikipedia accounts. So to maintain accountability and increase community trust, editors are generally expected to use only one account. 
So those with sock puppets have one real account that they use and they get promoted to a really high senior level of editorship and they have very little oversight at that point. And then they start new random accounts that they make edits through and then they switch to their senior account and approve those edits before anybody else can see them. So the more they do this, they build up this army of different usernames with varying levels of seniority, which can allow them to control a Wikipedia page and thus its narrative. So a Wikipedia page that's been edited by multiple editors gives the illusion of veracity and impartiality. But when all the accounts are actually run by one person, they dominate and control the narrative. They reject edits to the page that they don't like and allow their own changes to the page, all while trying to give the illusion that the page was compiled by many different people. So Wikipedia is aware of socking and the threat that it can cause, but it doesn't really have a good defense against it. So in our search, we discovered dozens of networks of sock puppets, and we began to link account to account to account, and it was never ending. We began to reach out to different editors, trying to understand the depths of these sock puppet networks, as well as pushing back against the bias that we, we would see protected in Wikipedia pages. When edits we made were rejected, we would push back against the editors and demand answers, because there are talk pages on each Wikipedia page where you can say, why was this change made? I don't understand, and try to demand answers. You can't guarantee an answer, but at least you can try and make public your concerns. It was, of course, very difficult to make headway, and it was incredibly dizzying and darker than I ever could have imagined. <coughs> so I graduated with my master's, and after a short while, Dr. Solstice let me know that he was planning to start a foundation dedicated to honoring the memory of the protesters of the Rosenstrasse protests and reconnecting their descendants. So I was really honored when he asked me to come on board as the project manager of the Rosenstrasse Foundation. I continue to manage, oh, I'm talking for too long. I'll go fast. Um, <laughs> I continued to manage the undergraduate research assistants. We delved deeper into Wikipedia, actively trying to clean up the Wikipedia pages, including the one on the Rosenstrasse protest, and fighting against editors that were guarding the page and that were keen to keep it their own. Um, and our research continued to expand. We began tracking down Rosenstrasse protesters and their descendants, doing genealogy research, and we actually started off a handwritten list that Dr. Solstice had written while he was doing the initial research for his book, um, and one by one, we attempted to track down each woman and her family. Had they stayed in Germany or left? Where were they? And there were just so many wonderful questions to ask as we were going down this research. We began creating family pages for those involved in the Rosenstrasse protest so that others could hear and learn about their individual experiences and allow their testimony to set the stage of the protest and what it had been about. From these family pages, we began to widen our scope and allow the stories of German women involved in rescue and resistance during the Holocaust, highlighting the many worthy stories of these women for whom history had long forgotten or overlooked. So the work I did with the Rosenstrasse Foundation fueled my passion for historical research even more, and I decided to return to FSU to pursue my PhD in history. Sadly, this meant that I had to step down from my position with the Rosenstrasse Foundation, though I passed the role over to the very capable hands of Liam, who's in the audience. Um, but my time researching the Rosenstrasse protests impacted me immensely in more ways than I can count. And my own dissertation research centers on women engaged in rescue and resistance during the Holocaust. The mission and the research that the foundation does is of the utmost importance in conclusion. The, the Rosenstrasse protest serves as a reminder that it is important to stand up against oppression and fight for justice even when it seems impossible and it inspires us to be vigilant against injustice and to take action when possible to prevent atrocities. Thank you very much. That's how we got Emma. Emma was one of my first uh, research assistants. <laughs> So hi guys, my name is Emma Racer. I'm a senior at UF studying political science and religion. I'm honored to be representing the Rosenstrasse Foundation today. Today I'll be sharing my research on the numerous women who shattered the glass ceiling built by the Nazi regime. Moving forward. In 2020, I joined the Rosenstrasse Foundation as a freshman at Florida State University through the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program. I recall bonding with Dr. Nathan Stoltfitz in our initial interview over my family's German-Jewish heritage. 
He showed me the doors that qualitative research opened to students eager to dive deeper into the history of Americas and farther overseas. As a political science major, this blew my preconceived bias out of the water. I thought that I pushed this out of the way for me because I declared a non-STEM major. However, as I'm standing here today, I was clearly wrong. Dr. Solstvitz and Daniel Warsansky welcomed me to the Rosenstrauss Foundation with open arms. Under their capable wings, my eyes were open to my newfound passion in conducting archival and genealogical research. Through my time spent as a research assistant and then eventual research lead after transferring to UF, my work revealed an underlining theme that caught my attention. As I learned about the female resistors of the Rosenstrauss protest, as well as the rescuers who opened their doors in the, to the, Jew, the Jews that needed immediate protection, I acknowledged the gap in my education. The American public school curriculum for me teach, taught me about the Holocaust, the crimes of Hitler's manifesto, World War II and its aftermath in domestic politics and the, the international scope. However, the bird's eye view that I was presented with of the, one of the largest genocides in history disregarded the testimonies and actions of the individuals who actually experienced it. The lives of advocates, business owners, mothers, workers, and students who didn't stay silent amongst the peers in Nazi Germany who followed the propaganda dis distributed by this political regime were excluded from the textbooks that I read. My history classes throughout grade school taught me the basics of the Holocaust, but the Rosenstrauss Foundation educated me. Now I speak for the prom prominent individuals that have deepened my former service level knowledge of this um, mass tragedy. As I continue my research, so do the opportunities where I'm able to share it. So today, I'd like to introduce you to my archival research on the presence of female resistance and civil courage in the Holocaust. <coughs> my research journey began with peering into the lives of the Rosenstrauss protest participants through biographical research using government archives that were preserved from the Holocaust period. During the this demonstration, as Dr. Solstwiss enlightened us, Gentile wives gathered on Rose Street for a week to valiantly speak against the Gestapo's imprisonment of their Jewish husbands in February of 1943. I conducted biographical research on the Braun family. Ursula and Gerhard Braun are among the many couples gravely impacted by this act of anti-Semitism in the Third Reich. I'm honored to share their testimony as Holocaust survivors with you today. As the group chorus cried, give us back our men, 19-year-old Ursula longed to hug Gerhard once more. While under the impression that her fiance would be deported, she recalls feeling what the Rosenstrauss crowd labeled as the courage of fear. The biography Ursula and Gerhard stands out amongst the others of the Rosenstrauss protest. The couple were considered half Jewish. While Ursula was not forced to wear the Star of David because she did not grow up amongst the Jewish community, her fiance did and therefore was highly targeted by the Gestapo. He recalls in a later interview preserved um, in the archives that I read that he was taken into custody at Rosenstrauss while on sick leave. While detained, he could faintly make out the cries and chants of the women who flooded Rose Street during the protest. When his mother informed Ursula of Jahard's arrest, as well as the gravity of the Gestapo's actions, she stated that the only thing to do was to join the crowd and hope in her later interviews. The devout public rejection demonstrated by the women who participated in the Rosenstrauss protest invoked a great response within the Berlin community. The attention brought to the flagrant actions of the Third Reich was overarchingly negative, which is a sentiment that the Third Reich had not experienced with such tenacity and in such great volumes. This started a game of high stakes chess between the Third Reich and the female resistors. To continue with, inter with arresting intermarried Jews, a total of which staggered above 2,000, would further the true goal of the Nazis. On the other hand, these actions would be under the scrutiny of the increasingly negative public eye. For the wives who were determined to hold their husbands once more, seven days advocating for their release felt more <coughs> like a second. On the other hand, their immediate safety was threatened by the presence of the Gestapo. Through Ursula and Gerhard's testimony, my research revealed the crux of the Nazi regime. Technicalities, descriptions, and labels like half-Jewish did not matter. Anti-Semitism is and was a prevalent form of discrimination that wasn't hindered by the lingering hesitations of the Third Reich. 
The diary of Joseph Goebbels attests to this. He wrote, during the war, there is no longer time to be all too sentimental in judging. The final solution was clear to the Nazis and the mass public support that they received for it only furthered it. In March of 1943, the Rosenstrasse protests came to a close. As the Gestapo released the Jews that they had unjustly detained, Ursula and Gerhard were reunited. In the years to come, they would get married, start a family, and thrive in their chosen careers. This is a primary example of social protest. Occurrences of female resistance, as well as women-led heroism like the Rosenstrasse protest, are often out overshadowed, especially in my disproportional education of Holocaust history. Nonetheless, their copious contribu contributions to the opposition in the Nazi regime are and were immeasurable. Discovering the stories of of recounting the steadfast bravery displayed during the Rosenstrasse protest has been one of the most rewarding experiences during my research journey. This year, I've gotten the opportunity to write a senior honors thesis through the Department of Political Science at UF. My studies in policy change and backfire in the Florida public education system are coupled with an honors research methods class where we're taught about qualitative research. Much like my expertise in the Rosenstrauss Foundation, this class has been focusing on dissecting narrative interviews by asking questions such as, how is raw emotion conveyed through the words of an interview interviewee on paper? How can we use this for research purposes? This class introduced me to the novel, The Hand of Compassion, written by Kristen Monroe. In this, she interviews five individuals who lived th throughout the Holocaust. As each of the narratives share how they specifically hid Jews in any way that they could, Monroe shows how they transform normal human decency into extraordinary courage under a political regime. The book states it best, moral choice during the Holocaust reveals tremendous power of identity in shaping our most basic political acts. This motiv motivated me to explore the moral compass of female rescuers in Nazi Germany. This year, I delved into the concept of civil courage and its presence within the Holocaust, as well as its application in modern society. Civil courage can be defined as concrete acts in opposition to injustice and human rights violation that defend the values of a pluralistic society. My archival research serves to commemorate the presence of this quality. Cori Ten Boom is amongst the individuals who stayed true to her moral ideals and is one of my greatest finds. Her life emulates the perfect example of civil courage, shining through the pressures of a political regime. She grew up in a tight-knit family of devout Calvinists. As the fifth faith placed an emphasis on serving others, she hosted a religious group that offered religious instruction to young women in her early years. On May 10th of 1940, the Third Reich invaded the Netherlands and a week later occupied the region that she called home. Despite the inherent differences between Judaism and Calvinism, her beliefs respected Jews as God's ancient people. Throughout the Holocaust, Corey made an eternal effort to protect the Jewish families that lived in her neighborhood. And as her helping arms stretched wide and welcome, her room and her house was converted into a secret bunker that was equipped with an alarm that sounded during spontaneous Nazi raids. Corey always maintained a light and cheerful attitude while in this household. Despite the kind demeanor that she ex displayed, it was betrayed by the Dutch that lived in the surrounding area. The, the Gestapo arrived at her door on February 28, 1944. Corey, her sister, and her father were all arrested. However, the Jews that lived within her house were not never found. Corey and her family spent the next several months in prison while enduring harsh living conditions, hunger, and disease. Her father grew severely ill and passed away due to, due to the lack of proper medical care. While still in mourning, Corey and her sister were transferred to two different concentration camps. Her sister's health suffered the move and she passed away in December of 1944. Corey looked to find solace within her faith. She prayed for a miracle that would allow her to return to her childhood home. Twelve days later, a clerical heir granted her liberation. At the end of World War II, Carrie started a rehabilitation service for Holocaust survivors. For the next 30 years, she would provide Holocaust awareness abroad through presentations and novel publications. She died at the age of 91 in 1983, 
but her legacy lives on as the protector of over 800 Jewish lives. Civil courage is a powerful representation of strength to character. Corey Ten Boom, amongst other rescuers, served their moral duty by turning it off to satisfy the deeds of a political regime. This speaks to the contemporary society. Would you be convicted in a time where altruism was necessita necessitated? I urge you all to ask yourself this. If my research has taught me anything, it's that civil courage lives amongst us. It's in our past heritage, the history that shapes our nation today, and most importantly, the product of social protest that comes. Today, I want to thank Dr. Koda, Dr. Sulfitz, Liam for allowing me to speak about my origin story and my research within the Rosenstrauss Foundation. I would have never thought that I would have the capacity to share about the female resistors and rescuers that live with that lived during the Holocaust in this capacity. Thank you. My name is Sarah Brophy. I'm a junior at Florida State University, double majoring in political science and history. I'm going to go first over how I found the Rosenstrasse Foundation and then the research it has led me to with Dr. Stoltzfus. So I too got my start with the Rosenstrasse Foundation from the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program. At this point, I know it's shocking. Um, <laughs> But I actually didn't choose this project as my uh, Europe mm -hmm. project. I'd already accepted another uh, project when this came my way, but I decided, you know what, I'm gonna do it. So for the two semesters, I juggled uh, international diplomacy during World War II with Japan and the Rosenstrasse Foundation. And I found so much joy in the work. A lot of times when we're talking about the Holocaust or World War II, it rightfully so can be very hard. It's a hard, difficult history to come to terms with. But the Rosenstrasse protests show that there's hope and light even in the darkest of times. I personally was drawn to it as a Jewish woman from an interfaith household as this amazing act of resistance that I could see shown in my own family had we been um, in Germany at the time. So this kind of brought to light the importance of how identities shift over time. So through this, I was able to learn so much about the Rosenstrasse protests, but I did a lot of work in women's civil courage. Um, one such case was the Lewinsky family uh, with Ruth, who came. She was actually at the Rosenstrasse deportation center along with the intermarried men, and she speaks about how the women come and she can hear them screaming from inside and how they are the ones that are released. They get them released. After this, she goes to the hospital and talks about the doctor that saved all of the lives of the Jewish nurses at the hospital, at the Berlin Jewish Hospital. Um, and with this work, I still had a lot of questions, especially about intermarriage, which Dr. Stoltzfus gave me the opportunity to explore with an honors in the major, um, which is kind of where my work in this presentation shifts into the why. Why was it that there was this distinction in being in a privileged marriage? So we start in May 1939 with 20,000 interfaith marriages between um, Jewish spouses and Aryan spouses, according to Beefy. And we have this road to control, right? So in, the 19, in 1935, we see the Nuremberg Laws pass, and we see cases of Ross and Shonda come up. Um, and basically through this, we see um, Jewish men and Aryan men who have relation, intimate relations with Aryan women or Jewish women. So this is where the first instance of gender comes up. 
only men can be prosecuted for Ross and Shonda. So that's the first question, why? In these trials, we see the courts use words like the angelic Aryan women was defiled and Jewish women being portrayed as temptresses. So we see this very clear distinction about how the Nazi regime is starting to think about gender and kind of reconciling that within Jewish versus Aryan men and women. So this leads into 1938, where the distinction of privileged marriages come in. In 1939, we have 20,000 intermarried Jews, the majority of which are Jewish men married to Aryan women. So to have a privileged marriage, which means you can stay in your home, you don't have to wear the star, and for the time being, you are saved from deportation. You could be in a privileged marriage one of two ways. You are a Jewish woman married to an Aryan man, always privileged. Or if you were a Jewish man married to an Aryan woman with children raised uh, as either Christians or not in the Jewish faith. These people were protected, once again, for the time being. But you have Jewish men married to Aryan women who are not given the same protections if they do not have children. Why? In the research, you can see this line where they start to kind of parcel out one group to make it easier to persecute them. In 1939, you start seeing these couples who are not in privileged marriages be being forced out of their homes into Juden houses. These were really cramped quarters, um, and it once again shows this distinction of why are these unprivileged marriages being forced to do this? Because at this time, all of the men in intermarried relationships from the Nuremberg Laws are no longer allowed to have their jobs in federal agencies and business. So this distinction comes and starts attacking the women's sphere of influence that's traditional in Nazi Germany. So by doing this, you are specifically targeting the women. Um, and through this, you see great acts of civil courage. Being in one of these marriages every day, you are facing the hatred of your neighbors and your families. There are stories of walking down the street with your husband wearing his star. A cousin comes and normally they would greet you with hugs and laughter. And in this case, she crosses the street. So this is something that they are dealing with every day and requires great inner strength to be able to do. So then we have 1941 and 1942, where we see tightening of laws. The important thing that does really confound the research a little bit is every jurisdiction does things a little bit differently. So now though, you see a little bit more conformity in terms of tightening this. More people are being sent to Juden houses. You see um, the Aryanization of assets happen. So now, Prior to this point, if you were an Aryan woman with a Jewish husband, you could hold on to all of the assets in the marriage. But now they were held in protection of the state. And you have the one c conference that kind of tries to go over this, tries to make some real conformity. And there are no final solution or final um, decisions made on this topic. So these couples are still in limbo. If you're in an unprivileged marriage, once again, you're kind of in limbo. Right now, they aren't being deported in mass, but there's always this kind of overlooming Gestapo threat. At the same time, their Aryan wives are being constantly hounded by the Gestapo. They are coming to their door. They are finding them in the streets. If they still have a job, they are showing up there. If you have a child, they try and bribe you, saying that your child will have special privileges if you would only divorce your husband. And they don't, which is amazing because they are showing acts of civil courage and resistance every single day. Um, and that finally kind of brings us to the Rosenstrasse protests of 1943. At this point, uh, these women have spent eight years in uncertainty knowing that if they are going to divorce their husbands, they are sending them ultimately to their deaths. 
and you see privileged men in privileged marriages, the thing that is supposed to protect them being sent to the Rosenstrasse deportation center, and then they are going to be shipped off. So they, as our other speakers have spoken about, is they go and they protest for days. There are bombs falling on Berlin and they do not care. They are going to get their husbands home and they're released. All but uh, a couple dozen who are then released, they go to Auschwitz and they come back a few weeks later, right? So, and then after this, again, the question is kind of put off in 1944. You see some more um, of the men and even women in these marriages being picked up for task forces, but there is no mass uh, incarceration or deportation in this. So right now, my research, I'm looking through court cases and divorce filings to see what the law says. What are the reasons behind the divorces? And what can that show us about gendered history? Uh, I hope this summer to go to Germany and actually be able to look through the archives. But this has been my research so far. And I'd really like to thank Dr. Stoltzfus for everything, <laughs> for allowing me to do this research, taking me on. Uh, even without the Europe contract saying that I will do it. Dr. Goda for having this event, <clears throat> UF, uh, Hillel, um, and all of my amazing speakers. And I can't forget the amazing Liam Orsansky for also guiding me during this research. So thank you. <clears throat>
hearing the Rosestrasse protests particularly struck me, of Germans organizing on behalf of those close to them and taking to the streets in opposition of the regime. And how could one not want to know more about that once they hear that? How could one not want to try and spread the story? This, to me, is, is where the courage comes in, in civil courage, because it was the act of a minority going against the grain of society. And that was something that, that was very important to me when I learned about the Rosestrasse protests. So that was something that led me into the organization. Um, so as the research coordinator, one of my primary tasks with the organization has been coordinating between its two halves. So FSU, there is the, the registered student organization, which is a volunteer group, and then there are the, the Europe students who are under a research contract. They're, they're doing it as, as part of their academic progress. So I, I attend meetings for both, and, and I'm working to, to sew them in as we move into the year. Um, my main has been surveying, as I said, so the student program has been doing a series of, of talks. Dr. Stoltzfus spoke to us a few months ago, or a month ago now at this point. It was very engaging. We thank him very much for that. And uh, we will be having other speakers on a monthly basis throughout the rest of the year. The Europe students, meanwhile, have been meeting with Liam and I, and he's been going through uh, wonderful research techniques with us. So I thank them both very much for that. I'd also like to thank Sarah for her work as, as president and putting everything together. I think that a big part of my reason I was invited here today is that I bring a fresh perspective on the organization. I'm someone who's new here, like I've said, and the dedication, not just of the people who are already here, but of the new students that we're folding in, is something that has absolutely struck me. So, you know, what takes me from Tallahassee to Gainesville to speak to you all today? And I think that it ties into my own philosophy of historical study. I've been a history student for three years now, so I've done some thinking about what it all means, our study of the past. And, and history appeals to me primarily on two levels. Uh, I like to say that it is the context by which we understand the world. I don't know if that's entirely original, but I like to say that it is, because it you know, sounds very smart. Um, it, it informs us of how people operate in the past, and I think informs us of how people, and especially institutions, which I think have a bit more commonality, can operate today. Um, that's a more analytical side, and there's also a human side. You know, there's, there's definitely a compelling nature to these, these tales of, of great you know, courage and of, of people taking a stand for their principles or something, I think, that speaks to us on a fundamentally human level, and, and this is, a, I think, a very good example of that. So um, that, those are the two kind of my main aspects of historical philosophy and how I think the Rose Strauss approach is, and how civil courage in general really uh, coalesces with that very well. Um, I'd like to take some time also to discuss something that, that uh, Danielle went into in some detail, but that's the Wikipedia research, and it ties into a, to another interest of mine, which is mis, dis, and malinformation. So that's something I've studied from uh, the emergency management side of things, also from the history side of things. It's been a passion of mine for about two years now, and I'd like to make some distinctions first into what those are. Uh, misinformation is unknowingly spreading false information, Disinformation is deliberately spreading false information towards a malicious end, and then malinformation is spreading information which is true but not meant to be public. Um, and I'll use misinformation as a catch-all term for that. And for all of my interest in it over the past two years, I'm admittedly an amateur on the subject of actually seeking out and combating false information. So coming into the Rosestrasse Foundation and being able to look through the work we've done in past years and, and seeing the dedication with which they've been uncovering that on Wikipedia, I think it, it was also something that, that completely blew me away. Um, and I don't think that looking into the process by which Wikipedia is made and edited is something that, that occurs to a lot of us. I think for especially people of my generation, it is something that's always been there. It's something we take for granted. But there is this wonderful and interesting community of people who sometimes to the extent of a career put time into this and keep this information available and updated. Um, and I think that sort of mystery to the common person is something that allows bad actors to get in there and to, uh, to prosper. There's one report I read that um, involved the Rosestrasse Foundation undercovering one of the, the sock puppet operations that was being run by a far-right organization, this disinformation. And I'm sure you can imagine how a topic like the Holocaust might entice people to come in and spread false truths, untruths, and, and distort our perception of what happened. And I think topics like civil courage, you know, that benefits from the truth being known. So any, any assault against the truth absolutely must be resisted. And I, I really appreciate how 
the Rosenstrasse Foundation has worked to do this. I think it's absolutely in the interest of civil courage that the truth be protected. And so the, the most interesting part of the research for me is definitely that going out there into the internet and protecting the truth. I hope that in my time as research coordinator, that's something we can expand upon. That's something we can keep doing because again, it's, it's something that's so important to me in keeping the facts straight and not letting them be distorted. So I'm extremely happy to be taking up my position here at the Rose Strasse Foundation. I am extremely optimistic about what is to be coming through our, our work here over the coming year. I hope that we can build upon our past successes. I hope that we can continue to expand the scope of our research. I think we're on the way to doing that absolutely as we move into the integration of our two spheres for the year. I have very high hopes for the students conducting undergraduate research. We've had so many wonderful people you've just heard from already go through that program. It's made so many great researchers and I hope that I can learn as well as I'm working with them, as I'm coordinating this. I think there's, there's a lot for all of us to learn. I think that's all that I have to say. Thank you very much. I'd really like to thank um, our student speakers. You know, when I, when I read Resistance of the Heart um, when it came out, I, I found it to be um, uh, not only fascinating, but a, a, an incredibly inspiring story. And the fact that it's um, still this inspiring um, is, is, is inspiring in and of itself. Uh, the, these were were wonderful, wonderful papers, um, uh, and, and you know we're trying slowly to get um, a branch of the Rosenstrasse Foundation started here. Um, but I want to turn things uh, over to our group and and uh, uh, see if the audience has questions. Yes, I'm interested in in uh, Wikipedia and. Uh, you know, some, someone mentioned that you grew up with Wikipedia, assumed it was always there. Uh, how, how new was it to you that um, this was, you know, that while you were writing something, your brother might be at home erasing it? Well, for me personally, I actually am quite familiar with that. I got into uh, disinformation, misinformation around the time the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war started, which was almost immediately a, a hotbed. I think the... Uh, the article on the, the extant Russo-Ukrainian conflict saw 500 to 1,000 edits the night that, um, <coughs> that hostilities resumed in 2021. And um, so I, I had a little background in that. Also, from my emergency management background, there's a lot of, of uh, information about disasters getting distorted once that's happened. So I was a little familiar with it, but not to the, the technical intricacies of the process of exposing misinformation that, that I learned through the Rosa Strasse Foundation. I started using Wikipedia in middle school because I'm much older. Um, but I, it was, you know, not in its infancy, but like having access to the internet and being able to use the internet to do my homework and things like that. And I think I really took it for granted. And I, it wasn't really until we started working on it with Dr. Solstice, I had no idea who was behind Wikipedia and I'd never really thought about it. And this was the first time I had to like, be, I, that not even that I was considering it, but now I was confronted with all of this bias that I was seeing and, and understanding how the organization or the Wikipedia work. And it's, I, I wish I could have gone into it more. It's, it's insane. Uh, yeah, so I didn't speak about this, but in the Wikipedia, I worked with Wikipedia um, spring semester. We are in a little bit of a, an editing war with an unknown person to make sure that all of the information stays accurate and checking every day. Just looking at the footnotes, seeing what's there, and also making sure that our research is current so we can keep adding um, credibility to the body of work. Um, and again, it's not something you think of. I think that we've all been told when we're writing papers, you know, don't, don't look at Wikipedia. I think we've all been guilty of trying to just get an overview of something off of Wikipedia, but it really opens your eyes um, to how easily you can spread um, misinformation. 
I'm in the same boat as um, Danielle and Sarah. I always question, why isn't Wikipedia credible? It's because you don't know who is behind it and who's actually writing this. So I did a little bit of work with Wikipedia during my freshman year, but none since. Uh, from what I remember and the research that I did con conduct, I remember checking it and the discrepancy between the male um, connotated usernames and the female connotated usernames. That was all uniquely interesting. It definitely has a different opinion, or has established a different opinion in my um, eyes as I go to look at this website and to look at the changes as well as the pages that cite, um, for instance, Dr. Um, Solfitz's page or the Rosenstrauss page, um, what's being shared out there. Well, I'd like to thank you all um, for, for wonderful presentations, and I'd also like to thank our, our faculty panel, uh, Nathan Stolzfus, Natalia Alexion, and Steve Knoll, for, for, some, for some wonderful presentations. I, I think you've given us a lot to think about, and I think you've also given us um, a first-hand lesson not only on um, uh, Wikipedia, but um, the, uh, the, uh, the possibilities. Um, of, uh, of uh, undergraduate research. So thank you very much for coming down and, and spending some time with us.